Hello, hi. Um, so yeah, I'm going to run through syndesmosis injuries and fixation methods and uh, results of pure syndesmosis alone injury. That's another talk in itself, <coughs> a couple of talks. Um, so I'm going to talk about diagnosing syndesmosis injuries, when you should be screwing techniques, how to screw, outcomes of various fixation, is this ankle just screwed? and uh, how you should screw. So there's a lot of controversies with syndesmosis injuries, when you should fix them, how you should fix them, how long to leave a fixation in, and longer term outcomes. <coughs> so just a quick revision of your anatomy, which you may or may not need. So we're looking at the anterior syndesmotic uh, ligament is here. There's is quite an important component with the interosseous membrane um, with a bit of ligamentous component of that and then the posterior ligament which has not quite an accurate diagram, it's a bit more transverse band the tibiofibular ligament. Crucial to the stability of the posterior ligament. <coughs> and there's some more pictures there. So diagnosing these injuries, so some of them are obvious, some are not so obvious and may be picked up on MRI scan or other imaging. Some you know are going to probably have troubles. Um, so when should we be screwing? So preoperatively there might be gross widening of the syndesmosis, a Weber C fracture, high Weber B, displacement and you sort of know that the syndesmosis is gone. Um, otherwise we're looking at intraoperative testing. So the mainstays are doing this hook test um, or ex and or external rotation test. So looking at more than two millimetres of widening. And there's certainly a case also for while you're there, actually just peeling up a bit further and openly looking at the, at least the anterior syndesmotic ligament and you can see whether it is or isn't torn and gives you a better uh, appreciation of how much instability is there testing without relying on radiology alone. <coughs> so the pr important parameters just to revise this um, so that probably the most important ones is tibiofibular overlap so on all views of the ankle, AP or mortis, there should be at least one millimetre of overlap. That's, that's this bit here. So if there's no overlap, then the syndesmosis is unstable. That doesn't apply to paediatrics. So they've looked at paediatric x-rays and children can have widening, which is normal. The other most important is that medial clear space, so four millimetres or less. And then there's also this tibiofibular clear space, probably not quite as accurate, but that should be five millimetres or less. <coughs> Again, that's that clear space. So obviously, you know, looking at Taylor shift and widening here. So if you're looking at an AP X-ray, you can look at that cross section there. So what we're seeing is that edge of the tibia is anterolateral overlapping the fibula and that's the posterior lateral corner of the tibia. <coughs> so some x-rays you think, oh shit, that's going to be bad, but the syndesmosis may actually be intact <laughs> and once you fix it back, it's stable. <coughs> so this is that stress test and uh, the external rotation stress test. So how should we fix them? Well, there's been lots of methods used over the years. Mainstays have certainly been screw and most recently we've got suture buttons or tight ropes. I'll talk about those. Other things that have been used have been staples and KYs and stitches. And we'll go through these points. <coughs> so when you're putting a screw in, the question is always should it go through three cortices or four? Everyone has their own opinion. Um, so a few groups have looked at this. Um, so a couple of years ago, a study on 48 patients looked at long-term follow-up, eight years of cases that had two 
tricortical screws versus a single four quarter C screw. Found no difference in functional outcome in longer term. No difference in the actual reduction of the syndesmosis. With all groups, it was a poorer outcome if the syndesmosis was not accurately reduced. Okay. They're obese, it's worse. If the posterior malleolus is fractured as well, then they're going to have a higher rate of late post-traumatic arthritis, 100% in that follow-up group. <coughs> and another group in the protocol where the screws were actually routine, just routinely left in, but three versus four cortices, no difference in loss of reduction, screw breakage, or need for hardware removal in both of those groups, which it might be surprising, but that's the result. Um, there was a very slight trend for loss of reduction in the three cortices groups for people who were non-compliant and who walked on their ankles early. Um, so then looking at just some general results uh, and follow-up of different screw fixation techniques. <coughs> Um, so they looked at the overall outcome comparing those that had had a screw left in and the screw was still intact with no loosening or breakage versus broken screws, loose screws or removed screws. So the findings were that the outcomes were actually similar if the screw was broken or loose, same as if the screw was removed. So basically the screw has lost its function and those screws are equivalent but were much better than if the screw was still intact and left in place. So there's certainly a component that if the screw is still holding the tib and fib stiffly together, that makes your outcome worse. So you do need some physiological motion at that tib-fib joint. There's no different in the screws uh, configuration or size of the screws. <coughs> And then so if we're putting screws in and then having to take them out routinely, what does that mean? Well, this guy's looked up follow-up of screw removal complication rates, 22% complication rate in their follow-up group, 9% <coughs> rate of infection after a screw removal, recurrent diastasis of 6%. Not sure whether that affects outcome. They didn't look at that longer term. And also when they went to take the screw out, found that 6% of them had actually broken in the meantime, which is always embarrassing. <coughs> um, so their findings relating to when you take out the screw, if you took out the screw six or seven weeks, was a high rate of recurrent diastasis compared with the ones that are left in for 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so screw is more likely to break if you leave it in longer. So their recommendations was for screw removal of between 8 to 10 weeks, antibiotics for screw removal, maybe a case for leaving the screws in and only removing them if they're intact and causing problems later on. Um, <clears throat> and then how do we go at actually reducing syndesmosis? So people have looked at this with CT scans um, following fixation and... It's, the results are not great. So there's a persistent diastasis, depending on what the parameters are for that, in this group of 24%, and a malreduction, so either the fibula is more anterior or posterior or is rotated um, in 52%. And the x-rays were poor at showing this. So there's a lot of x-rays that may look fine, but a CT scan really tells you the story. <clears throat> and smaller study just on those high webbices, should you actually plate the fibula or not, or just percutaneously fix the syndesmosis, and the reduction of the syndesmosis was basically much better if you plate and fix the fibula, which makes sense because you've got your length and your rotation all correct. <clears throat> Okay, and then uh, there's a little bit of a trend in the North America for some groups actually going in posterior laterally and fixing those posterior malleolar fractures um, with open reduction and fixation here. And uh, <coughs> this group followed up a lot of their cases and compared it to a 
cohort of standard fixation beforehand and they found even with their direct visualisation and fixation of the posterior malleolus and the syndesmosis, they openly looked at that. Still, there was an incongruity rate of 16%, but that was much better than if you didn't do that. <coughs> and the, if you've got a posterior malleolar fracture that you can fix back anatomically, that was much better than if you were just trying to fix a syndesmosis ligament injury because you haven't got any bony landmarks to reduce it to. So what about this tight rope device? <coughs> um, so it's a, if you have or haven't seen it, this, it's like a bit like an endo button. You pass it through, flip it over and tighten it down <coughs> um, like an endo button just through the lateral wound. You need to throw lots of, tie lots of knots to make it secure. The knot can sometimes irritate a little bit so it's actually good to make it a bit longer knot and cut it longer and then you fold that whole bit down to tuck it in. It's just a little technique tip. Um, so pros of this device may be, or certainly there's no risk of screw breakage, no need for routine removal, maybe can let them wait there a bit earlier, certainly without the risk of a screw breaking. It does allow some physiological motion at the tib-fib joint um, but the biomechanical study shows pretty good stable fixation and so this was a study looking at screw versus normal versus the suture button and so the suture button is equivalent, it's not quite as good in the sagittal plane but you can see the screw makes it very stiff uh, and the gap, the widening uh, was certainly as good as the normal uh, situation. Um, and a recent review article of some of the studies over the last five years has shown the uh, outcomes, functional outcomes, are as good or maybe better than a screw, quicker recovery, low rate of device removal. So overall sort of functional outcomes are as good as screw fixation. A couple of studies show an earlier return to work and your overall device removal is maybe 10% just because of that irritation compared to screws. <coughs> How you should put it in, well, we're still working that out, but one or two slightly divergent tight ropes um, may, be more, may be stronger, give a bit more rotational control. So that's what it looks like with a double tight rope. Put it through a plate. I've used them uh, quite a bit and been happy with the results. <coughs> cost benefit analysis, well no one's done this yet but if you think about the cost of taking someone back to theatre to take a screw out, time off work and recovery and the complication rate from that, it is a higher cost implant but uh, it probably makes up for it multiple times in the other follow up. <coughs> So what have we learnt from syndesmosis injuries? Well, we're probably not very good at fixing these, so you really should take some care and time checking that you've got it reduced, openly check that syndesmosis and check all your radiological parameters before you put your screw in. You can see here that posterior malleolus is not reduced and therefore the syndesmosis is not reduced. So um, posterior malleolar fixation has been shown to increase your syndesmosis stability. So there's been this traditional rule of thumb, 30%. But I think if there's any decent bit of bone that you can actually fix and get a screw into, then that's worthwhile and you've got to make sure it's reduced. You can just put a screw in anterior to posterior, that's okay, um, and lag it in whatever means you like of this here and the ligaments attached here so that's part of <coughs> Do your testing, uh, check it's reduced, fix it, clamp it if at all necessary is good and you can check it on the x-ray with a pelvic reduction clamp if you've got that tib-fib overlap. <coughs> so uh, which way should we be going with these? Well at the moment Happy with the tight ropes, but the, we still need some further follow-up and longer uh, follow-up studies just to check that that's safe and legitimate fixation. 
if you still enjoy screwing, um, recommendations would be use whatever size screw you're comfortable using. Three or four cortices is fine. I think the most important thing is just making sure the syndesmosis is reduced. Maybe if it's a non-compliant patient or very large, then a big screw through all cortices will make you sleep soundly. If you're putting the screw in, take it out between 8 to 10 or 11 weeks. Re-X-ray just prior to removal so you don't get an embarrassing situation with a broken screw. Give them antibiotics. And maybe for patients where you don't want to have to take them back to theatre, there's a case for leaving the screw in indefinitely. But if they've got some symptoms and the screw's intact a few months further down the track, then you can easily take it out later on. I hope the weather's good out there today.